you know, one of these days I'm going to figure out all of this crap. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or, probably never. You know, I think I have the same glasses you do, but I turn mine into sunglasses. I have them with black rims. Oh, nice. Like you have that. to keep tightening the little corners because it gets loose. Because they yeah. fall off otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have the same thing. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. We'll see who, who else might show up today. Otherwise, we can just chat. Which is fine, too. Uh, you're going to be in Atlantic City, I assume. Yep. Yeah, we've got a booth. Same booth I had in, uh, in California. Well, yeah, I never got, you know, California was so jammed with uh, seminars and workshops. And I mean, I got to the floor. I think I went to, I got to three booths. And it was the best trade show I've been to in probably 10 years, at least for a, you know, a t-shirt. If not more. I think it's the best one they've ever had out there. Yeah. I think people just wanted to come out and get, get off Zoom and come out into the, you know, yep. see other live human beings. No, I agree. And, uh, I, you know, it, it was great to see everybody out. It was, I mean, my workshop, I never had a hands-on workshop with 129 pre-signed. That's amazing. That's it was of, crazy. I don't know how you hands on 129 people. That's a, that's a lot of people. You don't. <laughs> you don't. You talk a lot. You you do all kinds of other stuff. But um, you know, I just wasn't prepared for that. No, nah, you wouldn't be. I mean, it's yeah. I, I only did one seminar there, but I think I had 85 people showed up, and that's wildly abnormal for kind of an off-topic discussion. Oh, I agree. I mean, you know, it was insane, but all good stuff. Uh, I just great. found that uh, three people. Um, yeah, we do have people coming in, so that's good. <laughs> Always a plus. Oh, well, Glenn showed up. I mean, yeah, really? it's, it's all, I, I just noticed that. I don't, I don't think he counts, does he? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. We'll see if anybody shows their faces. A lot of people like to sign in and sit in the background. Oh, well. Glenn, you there? Yeah, can you hear me? I can. How you, you doing, today? guys? Sorry, go ahead. How you doing, guys? Good, how are you doing? Doing all right, man. Uh, Desmond, where are you from? We have Andrea from Idaho Shirt Shack. Hi. Hi there. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Good. I came on to see if your book was ready and saw this and thought, well, I'll see what it, it's about. You know, my book is, uh, I got a message from my guy. He said it'll be done before the month is out. Yay. He's just, he's just making it pretty. I mean, I, I, I finished <laughs> it a long time ago, but he's putting it into the actual format. So Okay, uh, awesome. So it'll be... Uh, the download will be ready before the end of the month, and then I'll have the hard copies probably within about two weeks after that. Okay. So, uh, and I'll be sending out a notice. So uh, you'll know when it's ready. I, you did sign up, I think, didn't you? Yep. Okay, then you will definitely get a notice. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Terrific. So do you know anything about Jeff? Nope. Uh huh. <laughs> I figure well, it's always good to learn, though. Well, Jeff and I go back a very long way. So uh, back to mm -hmm. the early 80s, actually. I may be the only person left in the industry who's been in it longer than Charlie has, probably. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, we, and we, we definitely used to kick around way back when we both had hair. And uh, <laughs> we're, a long um, time ago. It was 40 we're, years we're, ago. We, had, we even had very similar cars, et cetera. Matter of fact, we were just talking. I have the same glasses that Jeff has on. I don't have them <laughs> on me now. I changed mine to sunglasses. But 
over the years, we've had a lot of parallels. <laughs> and um, I guess the funniest one is still the, uh, the Long Beach show way back when, uh, what, well, I don't even know what it is now, that whole area that's being reconstructed when we went into the bar to get a drink. And um, it was a, as it turned out, we both had pink shirts on that day. And we go in, it's a longshoreman's bar. We realized after we ordered beers that uh, between the two of us, we had more teeth than everybody else in the bar put together. We got our beers, tossed them down, and ran the hell out of that place. Yeah, yeah our, our pink polo shirts didn't really fit in with the rest of the crowd. Uh, it, no, not, the only bar in that, it was the only bar in that part of Long Beach at the time. It was before all the pretty things were up. So. Yeah, I mean, when people come to Long Beach now, they have no idea what it was like way back. There was nothing across the street. There wasn't even a convention center. Uh, it was just a rotunda, which is really going back. Anyway. And, and uh, you're in Louisville, Colorado, Andrea? Oh, I think that was Desmond. Huh? That's something Desmond types. I'm in Boise, Idaho. Oh, yeah, that's what something came up that said something about Louisville, yeah. Colorado, and it's like, wow, really? Okay. Strange name for Louisville, Colorado company. That's Desmond. He said he has no camera or mic. Uh -huh. Well, you don't have your camera, that I can tell you. And we have Mr. Greaves joining us. Heckler. <laughs> uh, Richard, how are you? Good afternoon. Hey, and there you are. You don't have uh, you're on you're on Andrea, you're on mute. All right. Now so I'll turn my camera on for a second just to say hi. I keep it off usually because there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind me. <laughs> uh, don't worry about that. Richard, how are you doing? I'm very good. I got my your, your Mardi you know, Gras. My Mardi Gras. Gras. Got my Mardi you're, Gras. You're all done. set, huh? <laughs> I didn't hear what you said, Jeff. Hello, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Richard? Very good. My old roommate. <laughs> uh, I so guess we're the roommate. three old guys on here. Although Glenn is probably, I don't know, he may be older than we are. I think I think Glenn's a child compared to the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't necessarily go there, boys. <laughs> well, you're the only one. Glenn, are you officially retired or or you're not? Uh, I'm officially gray and planning <laughs> retirement in the next couple of years. Well, gray is easy. I mean, you know, where you all are. Um, oh, well. <laughs> you still have more hair than all of them. Well, I don't know. Richard might have the, uh, the corner on hair, but I certainly don't. <laughs> in the hair department. I have this first <laughs> part. Yes. Uh, Glenn, how when did you get into the industry? 81. And Jeff, you got in when? 74. Yeah, so you definitely got me by I got in at 76. Richard, you came in in the early 80s also, didn't you? 79, 1979. Milwaukee was 79. Wisconsin. Okay. I guess, Glenn, that makes you the youngster among us. There you go, see? Everything being relative, of course. Of course it is. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Jeff, how's your new machine going? It's great. We've been, I was starting to tell you when we were talking about the show, we have just been slammed since the show. Um, you know, we've, we've got, we've been kind of lucky because we have inventory and a lot of people didn't. So the end of the year, we we were shipping machines, and then the show really kicked us up again. So uh, it's been great. I mean, we've been very busy. We've got 
20 plus units installed now. I don't have any angry customers. Everybody's happy. It's running great. So and I think I think we've made some nice adaptations and it's a, a little more financially accessible for, for most people and does more than most of the other machines too. So it's been it's been great. I mean, we've really, really been busy with it. Nice. And uh, I guess I should say happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. We, we, that was what, a couple of days ago? Yeah, about two or three days ago. When I, is your birthday? The 13th. Oh, mine was the 19th. Happy birthday, February babies. Yeah, well, happy birthday. So you turned 70? No, I'm 68. 68. Oh, you're still young, man. Just, yep. Yeah, here's the advantage of turning like 70. It, <laughs> there is an advantage of turning 75. I no longer have to take my shoes off at the airport and I go oh. through that line where I don't have to do the hands over head stuff. <laughs> there you other go. Other than that, there's absolutely there's no, no other redeeming advantage. qualities at all to being that age. But uh, oh well. You are you gonna be coming out with any other units or are you just gonna stick with the one that you uh, are working with? No, I mean, we've got lots of other things. I mean, we, we can make any type of inkjet product that we want. Um, obviously, we're looking to, to go after specific markets. Um, and, you know, my last 15 years was building CTS units. So that was kind of the path of least resistance. It was quick and easy. And we just took knowledge we had and improved on it, you know, better exposure systems, better print ads. Um, we're already working on a hybrid system, a very high speed hybrid looking at the potential to take that to extended gamut, looking at some you know, high speed label digital uh, print on demand label printing equipment if you want to have uh, you know if you want to barcode or, or qr code labels in the shirts for, for any number of different reasons rad serial numbers um, so it would allow you to change on the fly so we give you variable data for label printing so working on some other really cool stuff i think probably the next next product to market will be a uh, actually the first thing we're going to take to market i, I hope to have it at, in atlantic city is just an exposure unit and and our onboard exposure has worked so well that we've designed and built a very high-speed wall-mounted scanning LED light uh, light bar um, for those who have purchased units. It's strictly for CTS, but people who have CTS that don't have built-in exposure, this is a really fast, easy way. And it's most of the built-in exposure systems don't have enough energy to really expose all the way through the surface of the emulsion, so you end up with under underexposed and or having to to, to post-expose. And I can set literally, I've set screens on fire with this unit. So it, 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 it's full exposure. We can expose anything from a, a you know, an old school diazo to a, to a, a very fast photopolymer. So people are in, really like the light source. If they bought other units, they can buy our light source, mount it to the wall, and it gives you that. So what, we hope to introduce that at the Atlantic City Show. Um, the next printing project is probably a hybrid toward the end of Q2 or Q3. Um, something big, maybe some, uh, like I said, looking to maybe add extended gamut, slightly different print heads. Are you going to work on a uh, exposing unit with a vacuum for exposing film, or are you going to just leave it alone? Probably not. That's that's a well saturated market, and it is. Our, our business is really inkjet, um, but this fits so nicely, and we already had this technology, so we thought it was a great way to build a system for. Uh, it's similar to some other people have tried in the past. They just didn't have the energy levels we've got on this thing. Like I said, it's it's a serious exposure system, so um, you know I can do photopolymer in 18 to 20 seconds fully exposed and it's weird because the way it works the the leds are so close together it's almost like a a point bar light source so we're holding much better detail i mean we're getting real half tones and, and very high quality uh, fine details so it, it made sense to do a separate unit for those who have other types of, of cts units yeah when i saw the unit out at printing united uh your dot formation is right on the money yeah i don't i don't really think nice. you know generally and we've done a lot to do that it's not any one thing it's kind of synergy of better print heads better inks we have very high density inks because we do control our own ink um the exposure system is really really good at what it does um you know we've really tweaked out the waveforms on this equipment so it doesn't just splatter ink onto the to the, to the screen it's it's creating an actual dot so we're actually hold at 65 line, I can hold down to about a 3%, um, which is, I think, better than any, any of the other CTS systems do. So. Yeah, I don't think anybody really needs to go below a 3% dot for what we do anyway. Not, so, not uh, in t-shirt business. Nah, you know, I'm so. not sure how many people actually know how to look at a 3% dot. 
yeah, for, for our business, I don't even recommend most people go to 65 lines. I mean, most printers ought to be staying in the 45, 55 range. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I love some of the stuff that people are doing on the very high dot counts, but for a day-to-day -day practical situation, I don't see it. You know, I think a lot of people try to go higher, but then they just lose the detail anyway, so it really made, you know. You well, know, the ones that are going higher are pretty much using image setters and film. Right. The ones who are doing it successfully, yeah. I yeah. Agree. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I don't know how many people, I don't know anyone in the States that has an image setter anymore that's that's doing screen printing. Even even if you did, where would you get parts for it? I mean, it's it's kind of a, unfortunately, it's a, a lost start to keep those things running. Yeah, I mean, I know Artem over in Russia has one and a couple of the other guys over there, but, other, and, and that's because they're more involved with graphics than they are with textiles. Right. I understand it for a, tech, for a graphic company. Textile company, I don't understand the expense, the uh, size, the hassle of getting rid of chemicals, et cetera, makes no sense to me. So, you know, to me, 65 line, I'm I'm all good with that. You know, I, we had Andy Anderson on a couple of weeks ago. He re he rarely ever went beyond the 65 line halftone, and there was certainly nothing about any of his work that you could knock. No, I, I, I never saw Andy print anything you could complain about. I mean, his, his work was always impeccable. Did, did a pretty good job. <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh, one of board here and there. You know. is, he's good at everything. You know, it's just disgusting. <laughs> it's, he, he, he has some of the most beautifully painted and built motorcycles in the world. His, his van paintings are incredible. His airbrush works great. He's just an incredible, uh, incredible person. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, seeing, you know, having judged a lot over the years, you see a bunch of really interesting stuff, a lot of good stuff, a lot of things that were done just to try and win an award. He would just enter his day-to-day -day stuff and win awards with it. Yep, it was always impeccable. He just did beautiful work. So, Glenn, what are you doing with yourself now that you're quote-unquote retired? I know you, other than posting a lot of photos on Facebook. Uh, a lot of spreadsheets. Uh, I'm a portfolio manager for Rico Corp, uh, the wide format program. And so it's more graphics than anything, but yeah. uh, I'm also a big believer in uh, Stephen Covey's principles. So, you know, uh, I've been involved in textiles since the early 80s, and I like to stay up with it. Jeff's an old friend of mine. You're an old friend of mine. Richard's an old friend of mine. So I try and hop on these things when I can just to keep my saw sharp. Let me know what's going on in the textile world. Well, you know, I mean, I do this every other, I try to do this about every other week. And um, it's kind of fun just to see who shows up. Sometimes we get none. Sometimes we get a bunch, uh, which is all fine. And all this is recorded and goes on my website anyway. So if anybody wants to catch up on any of this later on, they can certainly jump on it if they want to. My next one's kind of interesting. I think uh, I'm going to be working for the first time with a Native American company. So uh, never really had the opportunity. And so uh, going down to Page, Arizona to uh, work with a company down there that's quite small, but uh, looking to put in things, but um, it's part of the Navajo reservation and uh, really looking forward to that. Hoping that they actually have some food down there. I checked the restaurants. No, none of them have Native American restaurants. We do have one in Denver. I think there are only a dozen in the country, believe it or not. But uh, the one in here in Denver, the food is very much on in tune with Mexican. But then there are some other things. I'm hoping that I get invited to a dinner or something like that. I'm just dying of curiosity. I love food. So, you know, uh, whatever they put in front of me is not an issue. But I'm I'm hoping. But I'm kind of looking forward to that. So I'm going to have that one on. I'm going to have her on uh, Charlie's Corner when I'm down there, which is, uh, I think it's the 6th or the 7th of March. So that one could be interesting. We'll see what, what that fun. is like. Anyway, Richard, what are you up to? I know you're not up to a whole lot of anything good, but aside from uh, aside from 
getting ready for Mardi Gras? Um, having a big Mardi Gras at my not stepdaughter's uh, store. She's closing her store down because we don't like the way we were treated the last few years at the at the New Orleans style restaurant. Uh, so she, we're having a private party at her store, which is a gallery. Oh, well, that's nice. So I got a lot of a lot of work as soon as I get off of this. I have to be schlepping a lot of stuff over there. But uh, other than that, I'm rebuilding a factory. Uh, just 20 minutes from here, factory uh, burned down March 31st. And we're finally able to start putting the equipment back up. So mm -hmm. probably won't be running, you know, until the end of March, but. Um, kind of fun. Putting it busy. in the factory is always an exciting thing, I think. And this time, all <laughs> new equipment. Everything, chairs, Which is finally amazing. cabinet yeah. lights. That's really cool. Thanks That's for good insurance. They dropped him. He lost his insurance. He, he's got two more months to find another insurance agent. But uh, you know, they, yeah, they dropped him. And, and this is Michigan. Yes. Cool. Yeah, interesting. I always found building and setting up factories was a whole lot more fun than running them. Yeah, well, you know, there's nothing like going in, getting it done, and getting out the door, as opposed to having to hang out and make sure that things keep going the way they're supposed to. You know, I think all of us have been involved in some of that, and uh, I don't know, between owning our own places and working for other people, I don't know, you know. The only thing you really remember mostly is the headaches. The good times, they, they come and go very quickly. The headaches seem to linger on forever. But uh, I'm actually having fun. I'm, I'm writing a book about my years in the industry. I was digging through some of my stuff from back in uh, the 70s. You know, photos from my old factory and stuff. And it's like, whoa. When you, when you were still in Brooklyn up in that area? When I was still bootlegging like crazy. <laughs> Well, that's what I got into, you know, and so uh, digging out some of the shirts, not that I have my found photos of them, but uh, I did find a bunch of factory photos where we're sitting on top of, you know, a thousand uh, dozen uh, Pakistani shirts and, uh, you know, watching and seeing all the guys that work for me, or some of them anyway, uh, cranking away on the machines, kind of fun stuff. But um, I don't know. It's been fun. It's been a fun ride so far. At least the ones I want to remember. <laughs> Andrea, you're I I know I was at your shop during the last summer, wasn't I? No. Um I met you at ISS. I did oh, okay. the screen print training. I I was going I do a road trip through the Midwest and I know I was in you're in Idaho, not in Iowa. I take it back. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned to me that you don't make it up this way in your trip. Uh, you know, one of these days I need to. I, the last time I was in Idaho, I did a shop. I uh, can't remember the name. Uh, Cedar Creek Creations is the name of the company. And oh. um, can't remember where I flew into, I guess, whatever. Boise, the that'd be the only place. <laughs> okay. Unless you were up north, and then you would have flown into Spokane. No, I didn't fly into Spokane. I I, I did fly into Idaho. Then, yep, Boise, that's all. Yep, there, then there was probably about an hour drive from Boise. Huh, I, I, know meant, was, I wonder if you ended up in Mountain Home. All I remember is um, I was staying at a motel, and across the street, there was a little Indian casino. And, oh. uh you were in Twin Falls then, I think. Okay. Yeah, it's because little... there's a casino right there. It's right on the Nevada border. Okay, I'm not sure, but um, all I know is the casino was good to me for a change. Usually <laughs> they're not. <laughs> but uh, that's, I think that's the only company I ever worked with in Idaho. Uh, oh, I take it back. I used to go up to Sandpoint, Idaho, the Sneaky Tees. Um, and worked with them for many years. But I, I forget that they were in Idaho because they're, they're all the way up near the Canadian border. Yeah, standpoint. Yeah, we, 
um, I grew up here and we used to be a really small um, state and now we keep making it on the best places to live list and all that. And so we have just exploded in the past 10 or 15 years. So what's, what city are you located in? Um, I am in a suburb of Boise. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I I was up at Sandpoint. Yeah, I, that's that's quite a ways away from me. Oh, I know. Uh, it was all, well there. I'd fly into Spokane and have to drive down. Yep. It's been a long time. I used to go fishing at Lake Pend Oreille. Oh, nice. Matter of I fact, love you know, it here. It's gorgeous. Oh, it's beautiful up there. Um, I probably did that for about eight or nine years. Matter of fact, I found the photos. Uh, I took a bunch of the guys from the industry. So I got shots of Mark Coudre with me. And um, well, Ann Morrison was with us. Uh, everybody caught fish that day, which was really good. Nice. But that was my last, I, I can't remember. I think that was the last time I was in Idaho, which was probably 15 years ago. You definitely have to come say hi. You know, one of these days, I have no problem jump, jumping on a plane and uh, going anywhere. Yeah. The problem with where we are is, like you mentioned, we're so far away from anything else. We don't really ever fit in anyone's, like, trip yeah. plans. You have to almost go out of your way and come here intentionally. You know, it's part of the deal. I think all of us uh, that have traveled have, have gone to places that uh, were definite des destinations. It wasn't a place where, <laughs> oh, you were just kind of going along and bumped into it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. So you are you going to go to any other shows or are you doing the one show a year in uh, in Long Beach? Yeah, we just did Long Beach this year. Um, my son started printing for me and so I really wanted to show him kind of more about the industry and of course he saw all sorts of equipment that he wants me to buy now <laughs> well of course he did that's why that's why you go to shows <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're on our list one so, day so you're a manual printer automatic printer no nope. no we just got an automatic um last year we've had it for just about a year and um we're still learning but it's been great for us we grew 50 percent last year because of it and i am so glad that i'm not a manual printer anymore <laughs> yeah i'll bet yeah every time i have to print on the manual for whatever reason i am reminded of how grateful i am that automatics exist <laughs> It's one of those things you don't know how much you'll, you 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 need it until you have it. Yeah. And then you yeah. can't possibly go back. Yeah, yeah. I agree. That's funny. When Jeff and I started, there were two automatics on the market. There was a round one that Jeff was affiliated with, and there was the oval one that I was affiliated with. And so you had one of two choices. You'd go round or you'd go oval. And depending on where you lived, you made your decision. So one was in Chicago, the other one was in New Jersey. So if you were closer to Jersey, you went oval. If you were closer to Chicago, you went round. And if you weren't near any of them, then you tossed the coin and went which either way you wanted. <laughs> and both There's those companies so are gone now. now? And, uh, yeah, and neither of those companies exist anymore. Yeah, which, there which, are actually some really good options. It's It's gotten very impressive over the last few years. Some great options out there. Yeah, there's some great machines on the market now. I, I love the fact that ovals have made a resurgence. I always thought that that was a smart way to go as far as space. Uh, of course, the ovals today and the old, the old ovals are have nothing in common other than the shape. Well, that's true. I'm just waiting for them to come out with the automatic loading and unloading machines. Okay, so here's something that I, I don't know if you guys are, there's a company in Georgia, uh, and, and this is really interesting. So this company in Georgia, um, 
is is headed by a guy who's a Georgia Tech graduate. Okay, and um, the military financed this company because the military has to buy all their shirts from overseas. They don't. There isn't a domestic manufacturer for the military hmm. for their t-shirts, etc. And so they wanted someone to put together a company that could make the garments in the U.S. and make them worthwhile in terms of. Uh, financially and stuff for the military. So uh, when I went out to Action Engineering, Eric took me over to this place. And it's it's run by a guy by the name of Raj, who has done very well. He had a company, sold it off to like 160 million. So he has wow. the money to finance this thing. Anyway, I go into this place and there's a cage with machinery in it, huge cage. And there's a stack of cut parts, fronts and backs. They hit the button, the machine starts, it takes one of the fronts and puts it down, uh, lifts it up one sheet off the stack, puts it down, takes a back, lifts off one sheet, attaches it to the front. It then moves it where it gets sewn around the edges. So it gets hemmed all the way around machine then lifts it up, moves it to another station where the sleeves are put on. So first the right sleeve, then the left sleeve. Then it moves to another station where the collar is added in. Then it moves to another station and out the door. So not a human being in sight. And that so I'm looking at me. it. So I was looking at it thinking, well, that's pretty cool. But the part that I thought was great was the fact that it was able to lift one sheet of fabric and the whole yeah. thing with automatic loaders because they've tried them over the years. They couldn't get it to pick up the shirt. They can get it off, but they couldn't get it on. I could see that, especially with the different types of shirts. Because if you set it up for, you know, 100% cotton, which weighs a ton more than like a tri-blend, I would think that it would have a hard time. I don't think you'd have a hard time with the with the uh, with a jersey. I think you'd have a hard time with a sweatshirt. Yeah. But, uh, but when you look at the bulk of what's printed, it's predominantly jersey, whether they're cotton, poly cotton, or tri blends. And so, to me, I was looking at the machine, thinking, "Wow, forget about all the other stuff, which I think is important." But um, the whole premise of this thing was it could run twenty four seven, three sixty five. And it needed one guy to just go up and down the aisles of, mm -hmm. for a number of these machines being put in to make sure that the maintenance was done or if something stopped, you could just fix it, et cetera. And so it, the, the unit that I saw was their second series um, and they didn't crank it up. So they did one shirt in three minutes. And so I said, okay, how fast can it go? He said, well, in a new one that they're doing, it'll do a shirt in less than a minute which doesn't sound very fast, but when you can do 60 shirts an hour, 24 hours a day, it's a whole hell of a lot of shirts. But I'm still looking at it for the automatic feed, uh, automatic um, feed for an auto, you know, for a press, as opposed to a takeoff. Takeoff, they have, they, they've got that resolved. Yeah, I figure it's just a matter of time before someone way smarter than me comes up with a way to make it happen. Because I know, like, I got an automatic because there's such a learning curve in screen printing, and there's not a ton of people here. And so I figured the best way to get me out from behind the press to where I can actually run my business was with an automatic, because it's been way easier to train someone to run the machinery than it would have been to try and train them to manually print. And I figure if we can get it more automated, it would be even more so. Like you said, they just need one person who maintains the machinery. Well, we'll see what happens over the next couple of years. I'm sure that uh, there are people who are always looking to add something new to the industry. 
I give it to you guys because I have been printing only for four years and I have Photoshop and Illustrator and a printer and I hear about what you guys had to do before all of the technology and I thought I don't know that I would have printed I don't think I could have done it. I gotta tell you it was a lot more fun back then. <laughs> you can get away with murder back in those days. <laughs> That's funny. You know, some things just had to look good. Oh, how did it feel? Nobody cared how it felt as long as it looked good. Nowadays, it's got to look good. It's got to feel good. It's got to be environmentally friendly. The inks can't have any uh, lead yeah. base in them, <laughs> et cetera. I mean, there are so many more regulations nowadays. That's true. Yeah, well. Are there any questions that you have that we can answer for you? Um, I don't think so. I just went on and got your discharge um, pamphlet thing because I realized that there is absolutely nobody in the Valley that does anything other than Plastisol ink. That is all that the screen printers here do. So and you're going to get... No, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I just said, and so I have decided that I want to get into discharge and water based and see what else is out there because it's crazy to me that literally the only print that you can get here in the valley is plastisol ink. That's it. And you're right. You know what? I would certainly tell you to go forward with water based, even though it's a bit of a nuisance to initially get going. Um, once you do, you can definitely blow everybody else that's in your area away just because you can tout certain things that may not be totally true, but close to it. Uh, water base being not really environmentally friendly unless you have a filtration system, which is not a big deal to get. Um, but oh, certainly, for my washout booth, you mean? Yes. Oh, I have one. Yeah, it's like a three or four layer filtration system. All right. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, so now, now you've got clean water going down your drain, relatively clean anyway. So, you know, are you really environmentally friendly? You're certainly much closer than others are. That's true. So the only re the thing that's um, kept me away from water-based ink is that I have read that it's not good on dark colored garments. And like 90% of what I sell are dark colors. Well, I mean, that's really not true. Uh, you do have discharge, but there are opaque water basics. Huh, okay, I'll look it up. My solids acrylics would do what you wanna do. I mean, it's very similar to, it's mostly water. It's certainly no PVC, no phthalates in it. And it what did you it. call it? What is it? HSAs, high solids acrylics. You have, you have that and you also have polyurethanes, which are uh, very similar to HSA, other than it stretches a little better. Okay, it's crazy to me. I have been doing this full time for four years, a little over four years, and it is insane to me how much I still haven't even ever heard of. <laughs> Yeah, well, we've been at it for a lot longer than that, and there are things that come up that we haven't heard of, so. I know, it's crazy. Mm. But actually, that's why I'm not bored yet, because <laughs> there's just so much to learn. Once you think you figure it out. Oh, you never figure it out. Yeah, yeah. then you get a design or, yeah. The te technology changes all the time. That's what keeps it interesting. It yeah. does. You know, I, I, was, I was going through the book that I'm writing and I uh, realized that when I first started out, we didn't even do water-based, we did text dyes, which is an oil and water system, which you hear zero about now because of the solvent in it. But uh, it would dry like a water base, but you'd have to use solvent to open it up. So yeah, it was. All of you have been in this a long time. If you could give one piece of advice to someone, what would it be? find another industry <laughs> <laughs> you know it's oh, funny i was an accountant before i decided to jump into screen printing 
Nah, my, my mother made me take accounting one and accounting two when I was in college. When I flunked accounting one and two, she decided maybe you should become an artist. If you're going to be poor, you may as well be happy. <laughs> but no, I think, you know, I think the thing about this, and, and I'm sure we, we all have our own feelings. The thing about this industry is we're such an unknown industry that it doesn't take a whole lot of time and effort to really move up the ladder if you really want to get up there in terms of what you do, how you do it, uh, recognition, et cetera. Um, not that that's necessarily the overriding goal. I mean, obviously part of the goal is to make money in this industry, just like you do in anything else. But, um, you know, this is such a small industry that when somebody coughs in, in Europe, you hear about it here. <laughs> That's good to know. I I have been surprised um, at how many people think, oh, I'll just get a press and a heat a flash and open in my garage. Yeah, I, I bought a scalpel and was going to do a brain surgeon. It, it didn't work yeah. out either. Exactly, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then, I yeah, mean, the problem the from a business perspective is that they undercut you like crazy because they don't have any overhead. But I just figure, you know, they'll be back when the shirts wash out and all that sort of stuff. You know, it's Andrea, I problems. would say, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say it's one of the biggest problems in the industry is, you know, it's a fairly low cost of entry. So people get into it and, and, I think pretty much everybody, get, you know, they, they start, thinking, well, how much should I charge for a print? Well, Joe down the street charges 40 cents. Okay, so I'll charge 35. But they have no idea what their cost of doing business is. And so their cost of doing business could be 55. They're yeah. charging 35. And you can't, you can't lose 20 cents a shirt and make it up in volume. It just doesn't work that way. And so, yeah. you know, they, they, they damage the market. And then they're gone in two years because they, you know, priced themselves right out of the business. Yeah, I 100% agree with, like I said, I was an accountant before this. And when I first opened, I had a business partner who had been printing for 25 years. And that is what he and I constantly fought about was he wanted to be, you know, extremely inexpensive. And I was pointing out to him, we can't, we are losing money. Like it costs us more to make the shirt than what you're wanting to charge. It, it, it's fun, but unless you want it as a hobby, you actually need to make some money out of it. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I, th I think what a lot of people forget is somebody in your area is going to be the highest price. Somebody's going to be the lowest price. There's absolutely no joy in being the lowest price in town. There is a lot more fun in being the highest price in town, but you just have to back it up with your quality and, and customer service. Yeah. As I've been in it more and more, I've gotten more and more confident with my pricing, although I will say uh, COVID and having to jump prices as much as we've had to because of the price, that was a little uh, nerve wracking. But every time I've done it and I still am growing, I'm like, okay, well, apparently I'm still doing okay. You know, people want t-shirts. I mean, you know, we've been at it for a long time and, and it was back in the seventies, it was a fad. Well, you know, here we are in 2023 and that fad still continues. Um, I mean, and yeah. I go into like depart, I go into department stores and look at what they're selling, like name brand and they're charging like 40 bucks for a shirt. And I'm thinking that I will say screen printing has ruined me a little bit because I go in and I look at stuff and I'm like, that looks like shit. <laughs> like how are, how are they selling that for $45? My at kids 45, get a little frustrated with me. What? At, at 45, it's not bad. Go on some of the other website. I mean, I do a whole seminar on this. I, I've got shirts that uh, go for five to $800 a t-shirt. Holy cow. And they get sold. My favorite one, I, I, I show it every now and then. I don't have the shirt, but it was a company out of England. And it was a white sweatshirt with black trim on the cuffs and on the on the waistband and it had feathers sewn on it. And in the whole thing, it said size medium is sold out. The shirt sold for $5,340. That's people with too much money. <laughs> well, you only have to sell one of them. Growing up I'd never let them spend any money on printed t-shirts because I knew <laughs> what they really cost. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. Or, or I do like them for them. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. <laughs> My kid's like, oh, I want this. And I'm like, 60 bucks. No way. I'll make it for you. 10 bucks out the door. Like, we're good. My kids always wore fake Abercrombie when they were kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the good thing about having worked with some of these companies, you could go in. I, I had a client who was doing a lot of the Nike Jordan line. So I was always able to get Nike Jordan and the standard Nike line for free, as opposed to 85 bucks for a, for a Jordan shirt or 25 for a Nike shirt. That's nice. I just bought my kids some Nikes and they were like 130 bucks. It was insane. Although that was shoes, but still it was crazy. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's that old story. Uh, if you want it, you pay, yeah, you pay for it. And yeah. uh, no one has a gun to your head, but at the same time, if that's what you want, you know, then that's what you do. Yeah. That's true. Do any of the uh, uh, the rest of you have advice? Well, I agree wholeheartedly with Jeff in knowing your cost, your background, you know, kind of gives you a little bit of edge in that. That's the biggest thing. The thing that I've always tried to tell any type of printer is, you know, you've got your bread and butter work. The work that comes through the door, whether it be through the internet, be, be a local customers and so on. But experiment. Yep. Play. If you get an odd idea, you know, what's it really cost you to play around? For a screen printer, you know, it's the equivalent of R&D for a manufacturer. And if you hit that unique item, that unique look, that allows you to go outside the valley with your website and you're now taking orders from all over the world. And, you know, sometimes uh, in today's world, I just find that people are so stuck into, you know, in my business right now, it's, oh, it's political season. So all I'm printing <laughs> is corrugated. And all I'm buying is red, white, blue, and yellow. Uh, but, you know, the people who play come up with some very high value applications that justify a higher price, yet it may not, it may only cost you 10% more to produce it, but right. you can charge 100% more to sell it. So that'd be my advice. Because you're an accountant or you have a financial background, you should go to Facebook and join up with the Profit First for Screen Printers group that's run by Mark Coudre. Oh, there's a Profit First for Screen Printers? Correct. I did not know that. I do, I do Profit First. I'm in a biz, I have a business coach, and we're actually just starting that um process of like figuring out. I'm nowhere near where I should be, but we're starting. So then the next step is that Mark Coudre has also done, I believe, four seminars that are recorded on YouTube with Printavo. And I'm forgetting exactly which one it is, but when I'm finished talking, I'll quick go look it up. But there's one on pricing. And what Mark tells you to do, I'm just giving it to you in a nutshell, is he tells you to do a quatrill, which is a word I'd never heard of uh, <laughs> because I wasn't a calculus boy like Mark was. But you do a, a quatrill analysis of your clients from last year. So you take your top 25, your next 25, your next 25, your next 25. So you go to whatever accounting system you've got and order them by how much money they did with you last year. Okay. And then you take the top 25 and you focus on those top 25 because those are your best customers. And of course, part of Profit First, a majority of Profit First and something that I like a lot, and that is Mike McCallum's book, Fix This Next. Goodbye, Glenn. Glenn, thanks for coming Good to on. See you. Uh, in in Mike Bacallow, it's uh, another book he did, Fix This Next. He, 
he talks about um, whether or not you can afford to do what you want to do. Because accountants are not the planners that they might yeah. be. Um, you're, yeah. you're, you have a financial background. That's what I meant to say instead of you, you're an accountant. You can do your own financial planning and have a better understanding of it than any of us can. But yeah, but you're right. As an accountant, we always came in after the money was spent. We, yeah, you're right. So the planning of can't really afford to do that because so many of your clients, you're not making a profit. Hmm. And so many of your clients, especially the ones at the bottom, are using up so much more of your time and there's not a good return for your time. So ROT, return on time, because you might wanna do the school picnic where there's 40 shirts, but everybody brings their own check. You know, mm -hmm. you, you spend an awful lot of time for the moms and you feel it's goodwill. And yes, you're literally donating hours and hours of your time and so you you still need to decide to do that because it may be that you know Susie, who is the, uh, the wife of the president of the Caldwell Bank or whatever bank there is in right, Caldwell. Right. That's the only town I've really ever been to. I was going to uh, say, do you know Idaho? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I have two clients that I visited in Caldwell. IDEA, oh, nice. which I don't think is there anymore, and Carpenter. Oh, oh Carpenter. Oh, Bob yeah. Carpenter. Carpenters no. is actually who uh, my goal is. I want to get bigger than Carpenters, and they actually just yeah, they just got bought out. They just sold, so they have a new owner that has just come in. Well, they've been they've been in business since 1968, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Long time. Yeah, I visited you know, long time ago, 85, 86, 87, something like that. Yeah, to give you an idea, Carpenters is one of the biggest printers that we have here. Um, so it's funny because I look at these videos of other print shops and they, Idaho, we are just babies. Like we have such small um, shops. And so, yeah, I'm just an overachiever and I want to get bigger than that. <laughs> That's well, there you can here. use the, there you can use the internet, but your density is not that good in Idaho, right. which is why everybody wants to go there. So right, yeah. th that's that's a different advantage. So you've got to use the internet to promote yourself because there's no reason you can't ship anywhere in the world. That's what the internet has done. Yeah, that's true. Anybody can be the great and powerful Oz on the internet. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Right. Nobody <laughs> knows. Nobody knows how big your shop is when your website has you know a gazillion colors on it and moving yeah. things. Yeah, I actually paid someone to um, make my website for me because I did awful at it. And I've had people come in based on my website, like you said, that assume I'm a much bigger shop than I am. And so they walk in and they're surprised that there's only three of us in here. And I'm like, good, that means that it's doing what I'm paying for it to do. <laughs> yeah. But you also need to focus on what the end user is using it for. So if you're selling it to someone, are they selling it to someone else because they're creating an emotional bond between the end user that loves that ski resort or loves Indian culture or loves the state of Idaho for whatever reason. So you need to sell that emotion that goes like what Charlie said that, you know, when you really want it, when it's something you want to bond with. So when we're young, it's the cool car or the skis or, you know, whatever material yeah. goods when that you, you get older, about. When you get older, you want the motorized wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Richard. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <clears throat> oh, they look for the emotion in what you're selling because you're bonding people to the brand. 
And so it's brand identification you're dealing with. And that has nothing to do with technology. As much as we get infatuated with the technology, there are so few people that are really going in to Walmart or someplace like that and saying, oh, that's not very good. I would not buy that shirt. <laughs> you and I are doing that. We've yeah. all done that because we're, we're screen printers. But they see something and, ooh, that's funny. I want my baby to be wearing that because he's two years old now. Or, right. you know, whatever it is, there's an emotional bond. Okay. Well, all righty then. That's what you're really selling. Design skills with the understanding. How will they use this? And almost always, especially when people come in and say, how cheap can I get that shirt? That may not be the right customer from you. You know right away, oh, it seems like what you're interested in is inexpensive. Yeah. And then you turn it around and say, is that what you want your customer to be wearing? A shirt that will only last two years and then it'll be stretched out, the collar won't fit, something like that. You want the end user, you want that to be their favorite shirt. I've got shirts right. I won't wear because I don't want to wear them out and I never wear them. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I tell my customers who want to come in and get like giveaway shirts and they always want to go super cheap. And I try and tell them, look, if we go with a nicer shirt, they're going to wear it and then it's going to have your logo on it and then it's going to be out and about. Yeah. You want their shirt to be the favorite shirt. You want them wearing it all the time because of the art or the shirt itself, something that is usually overlooked. Right, I agree. Thank you all for all your advice. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming <laughs> yeah, on. I think I'm gonna be back next time. I actually all just right. happened to get on Charlie's website and saw it on your website and thought, oh, I'll jump in and see what it is. I do this every other week. Oh yeah, I'll be back. It's one thing that, I have learned in just being in Facebook groups and talking to other printers is it surprises me how many people seem to do like what you said and they just get stuck in their ways and like that's how they do it and they don't grow and they don't advance and that's crazy to me like I always am trying to grow and advance. Well, so. I think most people think that they want to do it but they always drift back to what they're comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. All nice. right. Awesome. Well, I will see you in two weeks then. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Thanks all for coming on. Jeff, thanks so much for being yeah. here. Appreciate it. Richard, okay. always good to see you. Good to and you. Uh, Andrea, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks then. Yeah, have a Terrific. good week, guys. Thanks. All right. Have a good one, guys. I'll shut this down. And this is going to be on the website if anybody wants to uh, catch up with it. See you in Atlantic City. Jeff, thanks. I'll see you in Atlantic City.